In a minute now, we're going to have the wonderful Julia Mason, the paediatrician, and Dr. Mason will offer us some insight on what may be going on in the college students' developing brain and how exploring identities can be common during the college years. She'll also educate us on comorbid conditions such as autism and ADHD and how these might play a role in those questioning their gender. And I want to point out that it's great that we've had over 350 registrants from over 170 colleges um, um, and schools uh, from around the US and Canada. And it's, it's extraordinary when you think about it, um, how many people have registered. And a lot of people will be getting the recording because they can't make the time, you know, this specific time to watch it live. So I think we might uh, welcome the lovely Julia. Okay, hi, thank you. I'm Julia Mason and I've been a pediatrician for, 28 years. I've had a special interest in ADHD for decades. I'm here to talk about the college students developing brain. Technically, most high school graduates are legal adults since they're over 18 years of age. But as all of you know, young adults are not given free reign to do whatever they desire, buying alcohol, renting a car, adopting a child. There are barriers put up by society until you reach various ages. Young people in college are in a liminal state between childhood and full adulthood. We call this adolescence. Over the years, different experts have defined the borders of adolescence in different ways. And it does seem that the upper age limit for adolescence keeps creeping upwards as we learn more about the brain and how it develops. But back in 1904, the psychologist Stanley Hall wrote a two volume opus on adolescence and he concluded it ran between the ages of 14 and 24. Then back in the 50s, 60s and 70s, Dr. James Tanner, a British pediatrician, studied the progression of puberty in the physical sense and his Tanner stages are still used to track progress. In 1986, the World Health Organization created a report called Young People's Health Challenge for Society. And unlike the graphic they created by the journal Nature here, in the report, they define young people as those between age 10 and 24. In another big paper on adolescence, Susan Sawyer proposed the same duration from age 10 when puberty begins to age 24 when most brain development is completed. She said, adolescence could be conceptualized as a phase of brain growth that begins before the visible signs of puberty around six to eight years of age and continues for another two decades. Historically, the end of adolescence was marked by social role transitions like marriage and parenthood. The average age of marriage has been trending up as more Americans wait longer to get married. According to 2018 statistics, the average age at which men, women got married was around 28 years, and for men it was more like 30 years. In 1920, women married at about 21 years, and the men were closer to 25. Only 29% of Americans aged 18 to 34 years old were married in 2018, compared to 59% in 1978. One of the biggest differences between the developing adolescent brain and a mature adult brain is how decisions are made. Younger brains have more neurons, but slower connections. Maturation during adolescence involves synaptic pruning, myelinization, gray matter maturation, developing better functional connectivity, and maturation of the prefrontal cortex. The limbic system, represented by the amygdala and the ventral striatum in this graphic, develops faster than the prefrontal cortex and thus is more dominant in youth. Young people feel things more intensely and are sometimes immune to logic. They will make a different decision when their emotions are running hot than they would when they're calm, cool, and collected. This can lead to regret. Mature adults lean on the prefrontal cortex for making decisions, which gives them a better awareness of things like the long-term consequences of a particular decision. 
The images here were obtained by getting sequential MRI scans on the same individuals over a 10 year period. The pattern of maturation is very similar in most individuals, but the timing can vary. Something we see over and over is that the prefrontal cortex, the seat of executive function, is generally the last part of the brain to fully mature. Okay, I just love this graph. I'm sorry if it's a little fuzzy. I, I got this with a screenshot from a webinar in 2021. Rita Kertakaltiala is an adolescent psychiatrist in Finland who was tasked with setting up the adolescent gender clinic there around 2012. She published a paper in 2019 sharing her experience with medical gender transition, which was that those who did well in terms of psychiatric symptoms and functioning before cross-sex hormones mainly did well during transition. Those who had psychiatric treatment needs or problems in school, peer relationships, and managing everyday matters outside of the home continued to have problems during transition. Her conclusion was that medical gender reassignment is not enough to improve functioning and relieve psychiatric comorbidities among adolescents with gender dysphoria. Appropriate interventions are warranted for those psychiatric comorbidities and problems in adolescent development prior to pursuing medicalization of gender dysphoria. She gave a talk to medical students and residents in Florida about her experience and a friend screenshot this graph, which I just love. It's worth taking a moment to see all the parts. So physical development advances the most rapidly and it peaks soon after age 16. The cognitive development lags a bit. It starts out increasing rapidly and then it moves to having a slow increase. Emotional development actually backtracks roughly in middle school and then proceeds to improve with the boys lagging behind the girls a bit. And then finally, ranging wildly between the higher cognitive abilities and the lesser emotional capabilities is the behavior of the individual young person. One day they're taking good care and making good decisions. And the next day they are letting things go and making poor decisions. Isn't that just like life? Okay, so that's a very brief overview of adolescent brain development. ADHD is a relatively common neurodevelopmental disorder that can significantly affect the timeline of adolescent brain development. ADHD affects multiple parts of the brain, as is described here. The process of brain maturation in individuals with ADHD is delayed, although it follows the same pattern as neurotypical individuals. The development of the prefrontal cortex was delayed five years in one study. This implies that young people with ADHD may not be making their best decisions until they're getting pretty close to 30 years old. Now, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder that changes the development of the brain in more ways than just the timing. This graphic is from a study of DTI, which is a type of MRI. The key finding of the analysis was reduced connectivity within the corpus callosum in adolescent and young adult ASD patients compared to individuals in the control group. The corpus callosum is a thick bundle of nerve fibers that connects and allows the two sides of the brain to communicate. In adolescents, they saw a significant influence of autism. In adults, the effect was even more pronounced. The results support the idea of impaired brain connectivity in autism, especially in the tracks that connect both hemispheres. Executive function is impaired in autism as well as ADHD, but it is not the same thing. I learned this when I tried to teach an, I tried to treat an autistic boy with stimulants to help him focus. It didn't help one bit. I've taken care of many patients with autism, but I am comfortable saying I am not an expert in autism. I am continually surprised at which of my patients whom I refer for an autism evaluation end up with the diagnosis. So I surmise that there's much more to it than I currently understand. I am struck by the large numbers of young people and adults in the trans community who are on the autistic spectrum. 
I've heard many theories as to why this is the case, and I'm willing to share what I've heard if people have specific questions, but I was unable to find solid scientific explanations for these observations. So in the interest of allowing time for questions, I'll stop here. Thanks for your time. I'm a board member of SEGM and the website I've described there has a lot more information on this topic if you're interested.